Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the session Abnormal Venous Flow and the Neurodegenerative Disease Part 2. Uh, because we are a little bit behind the schedule, would everyone mind the schedule during the presentation? Now, I would like to call the, the first paper will be presented by Dr. Johara from the United States. The topic entitled, Change in Venous Anatomy Associated with Sustained Venous Insufficiency in Stage Rebel Disease, please. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, first of all, I thank uh, Dr. Heike and the organizers to give me the chance to talk about Sturge Weber syndrome. Uh, this might be an outlier because this may be the only uh, talk specifically about a pediatric venous uh, disorder that I'm involved in. Sturge Weber syndrome indeed is uh, not very well known. Even pediatric neurologists uh, who are experienced sometimes are not very familiar with the disorder because it's rare, it's sporadic. Uh, individual neurologists don't see many patients except uh, in a few centers in the United States where these patients tend to uh, collect and uh, we are one of the centers. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, we don't know uh, too much about the disease uh, and that's why we are doing this research including imaging because uh, right now there's no cure and no specific treatment for Sturge Weber syndrome. And uh, it's difficult to study, again, because it's rare that the patients are scattered. Uh, we are relying mostly on case reports and small series. And uh, although the outcome is very variable in Sturge Weber syndrome, the natural progression of the disease and the factors that, uh, that decide whether some patients uh, do well or do really poorly are poorly understood. Uh, in our center in, uh, in Detroit, in the Children's Hospital of Michigan, we are conducting a prospective longitudinal clinical and neuro neuroimaging study since 2003 and uh, trying to build up a database including clinical and imaging database to better understand this disease. So all our patients are uh, children and we like to include uh, children as early uh, as possible and then follow them clinically and with imaging. So. Uh, what is Sturge Weber syndrome? Uh, it, uh, the disease has a few uh, very characteristic major uh, features. First of all, you can immediately uh, suspect that a patient has Sturge Weber syndrome because of the so-called port wine stain on the face, which is indeed uh, a capillary malformation of the skin. And uh, it, typically, uh, it's in the forehead, including the eyelid. This is the most common. Uh, this is a child. And uh, if you don't treat it, uh, then uh, some unlucky patients end up at uh, a very uh, disfiguring uh, uh, malformation on the face uh, later on in adulthood. The second uh, neurological feature is, is the leptomeningeal angioma, which is really not an angioma. It's not a tumor. It's, a, it's also malformation. And it's, uh, let me go back. it's uh, unilateral in 85% of the cases. And it typically involves the posterior half of the hemisphere, mostly the parietal occipital region, uh, but also variably involves the temporal and frontal region. But in 85% of the patient, the other hemisphere is completely normal. And in, in about half of the patient also have a vascular glaucoma and some sort of hemangiomas uh, in the eye. 
So on, on conventional MRI, basically the, the traditional gold standard of uh, uh, diagnosing intracranial involvement is T1-weighted postgadolinum images where you see uh, the leptomeningeal angioma, and then you see variable uh, deep uh, veins, plus uh, you often see ipsilateral and large choroid plexus, plus you see a variety of parenchymal abnormalities, including white matter changes, cortical atrophy, and calcification in the later stages of the disease. The typical onset of uh, the neurological problems is seizures. Usually, most of the patients start the seizures within the first one or two years of life. They could be mild or could be uncontrolled, and also there is a high variability of uh, mental retardation. It could be very mild or non-existent and could be very severe and progressive. So basically, currently, the only uh, option to really change the course of the disease and change the fate of these patients is those who have uh, bad seizures is to do epilepsy surgery. Uh, really, there is no, uh, obviously, we, we, we treat the patient against seizures, but uh, it may not change the course of the disease. Patients also uh, often uh, present with some phoconeurgical uh, deficits, most commonly visual field defi uh, defect because of the occipital involvement. Uh, some of them had so-called stroke-like episodes uh, with hemiparesis, and some neurologists uh, routinely prescribed aspirin to try to prevent this, but uh, really the, the uh, effect of aspirin is not very clear if it's really beneficial. And dermatologists uh, now uh, try to uh, prevent the progression of the port wine stain by, uh, by laser treatment, uh, by obliteration of, uh, of these uh, malformations in the uh, skin. So what is the etiology of sturge weber syndrome? It's really not very well understood. Really, the, the, this very peculiar feature that you have an intracranial abnormality associated with a facial skin abnormality is the root of the understanding of uh, what, what's happening early on, what causes the disease. So the traditional model uh, is based on, on this one, and this is what you see on, in, the, in the textbooks. So basically, there is this uh, primitive superficial vascular plexus, uh, which uh, drains the primitive eye region. And this is in close proximity uh, with the area of the future occipital cortex and the upper face. So if uh, in the first, uh, first trimester early in brain development, uh, something happens with angiogenesis, and uh, it's, uh, uh, some uh, believe this could be a somatic mutation in a subset of angioblasts or other blood vessel uh, supporting cells, then this vascular plexus basically fails to mature, fails to regress, and this will lead to a combination of uh, PL, facial, and eye vascular malformations. And this, this is what we see actually uh, uh, as a, a Sturge Weber syndrome. Uh, there's a modified an alternative model of uh, the uh, uh, origin of these abnormalities, and this was uh, mostly proposed by Cameron Persa uh, a few years ago, who uh, basically uh, postulated that there must be an early localized venous occlusion or dysplasia. Uh, which we don't know why, why it, it happens, but it will uh, uh, cause a venous hypertension intracranially, and this hypertension might be transmitted both intra- and extracranially through communicating veins and collaterals. And basically, in this model, the port wine stain, uh, along with the orbital and deep intracranial venous abnormalities, are secondary and compensatory rather than primary. Of course, uh, if we uh, accept this, then uh, we also might argue that uh, it's not beneficial to, to obliterate uh, uh, too many of these collateral veins, like, like the port wine stain, because that uh, may cause a progression of the of this is, uh, by increasing intracranial pressure. So either way, uh, the result of this is an impaired venous outflow, which leads to a chronic cortical and white matter hypoxia and uh, that leads to cortical white matter damage, which will manifest as a gliosis, atrophy, and classification, and clinically seizures and progressive neurological deficits. So imaging plays a very uh, central role, both uh, to uh, diagnose the disease and then uh, to uh, evaluate the severity of uh, the uh, intracranial involvement and also uh, uh, to follow, up, follow the progression of the disease in, in young patients. 
So uh, on conventional MRI, unfortunately, if you do the MRI too early, actually we may miss the leptomeningeal abnormalities. That, that's uh, very common that uh, a patient comes in with a port wine stain, uh, still asymptomatic, and the neurologist uh, uh, requests an MRI, and the MRI is normal. There's a false reassurance of, uh, of lack of intracranial uh, abnormalities. And uh, a few months later, uh, the patient has a seizure, you repeat the MRI, and you, you see the typical leptomeningeal angioma. So uh, the initial MRI and even MRI done at uh, age one or age two uh, is a poor predictor of what's, what's, go, what's happening later on, uh, both in terms of seizures and neurocognitive outcome in these patients. So that's why we are trying to use some more advanced imaging uh, uh, modalities, both to look at uh, vascular abnormalities and uh, evaluate white matter injury and also evaluate quantitatively cortical and gray matter injury, and we are using different uh, MRI and also glucose metabolism PET scan put together uh, to get a, a better picture of what's going on and better understand the pathophysiology of this uh, disease and its clinical correlates. So uh, if you look at uh, perfusion, brain perfusion studies that we did uh, uh, recently, uh, it's clear that the perfusion, uh, the decreased perfusion is not good for, for the developing brain. And what we found is actually that if we measure uh, both uh, cerebral blood volume and cerebral blood flow in the affected area, uh, the decrease of it uh, correlates with the duration of epilepsy and also uh, with high seizure frequency. How we do this usually, we, we utilize the, the uh, uh, typical unilateral Sturge Weber brain, so use the, the other hemisphere as a control hemisphere because uh, really with, uh, some of them, uh, some of these patients are very young uh, patients and it's difficult to get uh, normal control patients, but because 85% is unilateral, basically the other hemisphere is typically used for both for MRI and PET studies as an internal uh, normal control. The other uh, very important and, and interesting uh, observation that we can make is the development of uh, uh, these deep uh, transmittery vein, veins uh, or venous networks sometimes. And this is really very variable uh, across uh, patients. And uh, we see patients who have very little of this. And we see sometimes a very uh, extensive network of these uh, deep uh, abnormalities. You can see it on a T1 post uh, NMRI and even better with more details on SWI. So this is an 11-month-old girl, right port wine stain. You can see the right intracranial uh, veins and no seizures yet at this point, no clinical uh, symptoms. You can also appreciate some increased uh, perfusion in the, in the uh, same hemisphere. So what, what happens if uh, it does, it does uh, this uh, large uh, network of uh, collaterals actually uh, salvage the, the overlying cortex uh, from being uh, atrophic? So this is a four-year-old girl developing well and uh, has just very mild uh, seizures. And you, uh, you can again see a very extensive uh, network of both these deep uh, uh, transmitter veins and the uh, subependible periventricular veins. And actually, uh, if we do the uh, glucose uh, PET scan, you can see that uh, the cortical uh, metabolism is, is almost intact. So in this particular case, it seems that uh, these deep uh, collaterals really are able to salvage most of the, the cortical functions. There is only a, a mild hypometabolism in the uh, right parietal uh, region, otherwise the brain uh, uh, looks really good on the metabolic scan. It's not always the case. Unfortunately, uh, most of our patients don't have these uh, extensive collaterals. They have some in most of the cases, uh, but uh, if, if it doesn't develop and the, and the angioma is extensive, you can see uh, uh, this patient is a six-year-old and there's a large area of uh, uh, calcified atrophic uh, uh, parietal, parietotemporal, and occipital uh, lobe. And you can see that there's severe hypometabolism in this area, virtually no metabolic activity here. And although there are some collateral veins uh, in the central region, the whole frontal lobe is also already 
mildly hypometabolic. This patient uh, has uh, an IQ of 60 and a few seizures uh, per year. So one of the uh, most interesting uh, features uh, of Sturge-Weber imaging is the, the white matter abnormalities. And as we did uh, more and more uh, MR imaging, it's uh, quite clear that white matter is uh, severely affected and it has uh, very important clinical implications. Uh, white matter cannot be really well appreciated on, on FDG PET, on PET scan, but on MRI, uh, it's, it's studied with advanced imaging, uh, as, as I will show in a few uh, slides here. So uh, it's an early uh, observation uh, from regular conventional MRI that very young infants with Sturge-Weber syndrome uh, can uh, show a pattern which is called accelerated myelination. This is only seen in the, at a very early disease stage. Uh, it's supposed, it's uh, supposed to be triggered by early hypoxia and uh, maybe glutamate release uh, uh, plays a role in it. And it's invariably uh, followed by a white matter uh, atrophy. And interestingly, a similar pattern was also reported in uh, infants with cerebrovenous sinus thrombosis who did not have Sturge-Weber syndrome, suggesting that this is really somehow inherently related to an early, early venous uh, insufficiency in infants. <clears throat> so when we looked at uh, the white matter uh, volumes in uh, uh, children uh, at different ages, this is a cross-sectional study, but the age was very variable uh, of these uh, uh, children. They all had unilateral Sturge-Weber syndrome. So when we looked at the volumes of the IPSI and contralateral uh, hemisphere, we could see an increase, uh, increased uh, uh, difference as uh, uh, age uh, 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 got higher. And very importantly, when we looked at the correlation between the patient's uh, cognitive functions and white matter uh, volumes, there was a clear correlation. Uh, and this is actually a residual uh, correlation. Uh, this was independent of the correlation of, uh, with age and also correlation from cortical volume changes. So basically, white matter volume changes were the, uh, the strongest predictors of, uh, of the IQ of these patients. And, and now we're actually collect, uh, collecting data longitudinally to, uh, to look at uh, uh, this not, in a, not only in a cross-sectional study, but in, uh, in a longitudinal, longitudinal fashion. Uh, we can also use uh, diffusion imaging. Uh, you can see also this is an FA map, a fraction an isotropy map. You can see not only the, the white matter atrophy, there's less white matter here, but also see the abnormal uh, white matter tracts uh, as compared to the other side in the area where uh, it's compromised and also it's in this area uh, included these, uh, these uh, transmetallary uh, veins in this patient. <clears throat> If you looked at uh, uh, in the whole uh, hemisphere and actually whole brain, what are the white matter areas that m most uh, affect, uh, are most affected in, as a group? Then you can see that ipsilaterally there are uh, widespread white matter abnormalities. Even though most of the patients had uh, posterior uh, angioma, they also had some, some frontal abnormalities, even some abnormalities in the, in the contralateral uh, side as compared to age matched normal control children. And also uh, we found that uh, specifically the, uh, the correlation with the uh, IQ, with the cognitive functions, was mostly with the, the frontal lobe white matter abnormalities, not, not the whole hemispheric white matter abnormalities. Although not very uh, common, but it, there are also at least a few case reports uh, where uh, the investigators did not find any uh, cortical venous abnormalities, but they, they found evidence of uh, deep venous abnormalities. Usually these patients uh, have no seizures because the co uh, cortex is not uh, directly compromised, but uh, they present with, uh, with some uh, uh, neurological symptoms mostly. And this patient, for example, uh, had some right hemiparesis, and they couldn't identify the left internal vein in this patient. Another uh, location where venous abnormalities uh, occur, uh, not very frequently, but uh, we have seen uh, in about 10% of our, our cases is the cerebellum. Uh, it is usually not uh, alone. It's associated with uh, 
uh, supratentorial angioma and uh, quite extensive supratentorial angioma typically. Uh, we haven't seen any, any symptoms from, from cerebellar involvement, at least not obvious cerebellar symptoms. And uh, uh, some suggest that maybe this is uh, uh, due to an earlier, more severe uh, event uh, during uh, brain vascularization, and that's why both uh, the hemisphere and the cerebellum is uh, involved in these cases. So how can we put this uh, data together? So uh, right now, I think uh, basically what might determine which patients are doing well or which, which patients are doing really poorly is really uh, the, the matter of a balance or imbalance between the severity, the extent of primary venous insufficiency versus the compensatory collateral venous outflow, and whether this, this uh, compensation really works intracranially or or also the, some extracranial venous components play a role. It's, it's, it's at this point, it's not clear. But uh, either way, uh, the, the ultimate effect, if there is a major imbalance, that there is a decreased perfusion and chronic hypoxia, there might be excess glutamate, which both uh, 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 can trigger cortical damage and seizures, and or also may be related to increased myelination, at least initially. Uh, which uh, ultimately and uh, pretty fast uh, can lead to a white matter damage. And these together uh, will uh, uh, lead to this very uh, variable neurocognitive symptoms. So currently, really, uh, we don't have uh, much uh, treatment. We don't have treatment options really to, to attack uh, this whole cascade in the higher level. So we are trying to basically uh, control seizures but I think uh, if we really want to make a, a change in the fate of these patients, we have to probably go up here, try to improve perfusion early on, try, try to prevent uh, white matter damage, and uh, uh, maybe go even higher up and somehow early on affect their, their venous uh, flow. And I think uh, uh, the, the results of the other groups maybe uh, can help me to, to get some ideas how to, how to go on and, and uh, and tackle this problem in stage liver disease. Thank you. Thank you. That's a nice presentation. Any question or comment from the audience? Yeah, I would like to ask the first question for you. That you just mentioned, patient would have stroke-like episode. Mm -hmm. What is the mechanism of this? You suggest you use aspirin. Is the, the platelet aggregation involved in the onset of the stroke like episode? Mm -hmm. yeah, so, uh, so, yeah, aspirin is, uh, is being used, but uh, it's not proven. It's, uh, there are small case series that suggest that those who take aspirin, they have uh, less stroke like episodes. Even uh, there's one or two studies that suggest if you take aspirin, it actually uh, will help to avoid some of the seizures, uh, which uh, I think uh, makes sense if you, if you think that the seizures are somehow triggered by hypoxia. But really the exact mechanism of the stroke-like episodes is not clear. Uh, these, the stroke-like episodes are typically uh, uh, associated with transient hemiparesis. Sometimes actually it's even difficult to say whether these were really strokes, really ischemic events, or was there some, some uh, mild seizures triggering this, because you don't have EEG uh, on. So uh, uh, typically the differentiation is, uh, is, is clinical if they don't see any other, uh, any other uh, uh, signs of, of seizure activity, uh, twitching or anything else, they think it's, it's ischemic, but it's really not, not very well understood. Thank you. Please. Just want to ask a, a naive question uh, about this hypermyelination. Could you explain a little more detail about the increased that initial phase of increased myelination? Mm -hmm. Well, so this is uh, actually in our study we we haven't seen this because we usually recruit patients when they are about. Uh, one year of age or a little bit earlier, but this, this has been described at the very, very initial phase of the disease. So patients who are a few, few months old, it's always on the side of the leptomeningeal angioma. Uh, it basically was, I think, first described on T2 images, where the T2 images look like there is an early maturation of the, the white matter. Uh, 
also there is inc uh, uh, we had I think one or two cases where we uh, we had young enough patients to see increased white matter volume, which you would expect with uh, with increased myelination, and then it switched to to white matter atrophy, and. Uh, uh, the me mechanistically, I think uh, there's, a, there's a very recent uh, study uh, which uh, may uh, shed light on the mechanism of this, which uh, postulated that uh, in, in, uh, for normal uh, my myelin maturation, uh, the uh, normal synaptic activity uh, triggers glutamate release and that, that's a, that facilitates myelin, uh, myelin production. And it's quite possible that in this case, it actually, it's, it's hypoxia-related uh, uh, glutamate release that might facilitate uh, uh, myelin production. But of course, if glutamate uh, uh, increases, then eventually there will be a lot of excitotoxic damage. We actually did uh, some uh, spect and, and doing and very much interested in glutamate, and we, we have been doing some. Uh, uh, spectroscopy studies to, to look at glutamate, and we, we see in young uh, kids with, with Sturgeberg increased glutamate uh, in the affected uh, hemisphere. Uh, please, one short and quick question. No, actually, you just answered my question about glutamate. It was uh, one of my favorite molecules about 15 years ago, but thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, please. Uh, thanks for this presentation. I have seen one patient with Sturge Weber who is on dialysis. Uh, she is in dialysis, actually. She suffered from uh, transient hemiparesis during dialysis. What's your explanation for that? During dialysis? Yeah, just during dialysis, transient hemiparesis. Hmm. Why, why, is, why is she on dialysis? She has a renal failure. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I, I need to, to think about it. Yeah, let's move to the, thank you, thank you. doctor. The next topic, venous and the CSF flow in brain parenchyma of MS patients will be presented by the president of this society. Please, Professor Zimati Nomo. Thank you very much. So I will try to be short to save some time. Uh, I will principally speak about the CSF flow abnormalities in MS. My disclosures related to CCSVI as other uh, work. So we know that uh, venous drainage and CSF dynamics are uh, very much connected. CSF dynamic is dependent, uh, obviously, on the uh, venous drainage, and it's a balance between CSF ultrafiltration from veins uh, of the lateral ventricles and also the CSF reabsorption into the venous system at the level of the dural sinuses. As you know, five to seven times we reproduce during the day our CSF content, and uh, this has to go, uh, first goes uh, to the uh, basal parts of the brain and uh, to the spinal cord and then through the arachnoid villi it's uh, absorbed into the uh, principally more than 90 percent in the dural sinuses and uh, another 10 to 15 percent in the spinal cord spaces. So <clears throat> sign phase contrast MRI imaging of the aqueduct of Silvius but also at the level of foramen minium uh, we Cardiac triggering provides uh, a quantitative method for CSF flow estimation. And uh, sign phase contrast MRI has been really previously used for CSF flow quantification in healthy controls, patients with hydrocephalo stroke, uh, patients elderly. There is a lot of uh, work that has been done, and one name that comes to my mind, Dr. Alperin, uh, developed a, a lot of early studies. Uh, uh, but really, uh, in all these diseases, uh, n not much methodological work happened with respect to the CSF flow uh, quantification and imaging. So in the last couple of uh, years, we embarked on a number of studies with CSF flow. Uh, uh, trying to uh, see how this is reproducible, how uh, accurate it is. We did uh, flow phantom studies uh, and developed uh, a tool which we called uh, MAC, 
uh, MACC, minimal area contour change. Now, one of the key uh, problems is that in the areas like Silvius of Aqueduct, which is very small, uh, in terms of measurement of the flow, you need to be extremely precise and accurate how you are going to determine the region of interest because that's going to uh, affect your flow measurement. And also, you need to understand that we are measure measuring the flow due to the 32 uh, cycles of uh, cardiac cycles, so it's uh, both in systole and diastole, and placing a static ROI to some extent may change your flow values. That's why we developed this tool to kind of uh, 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 measure over 32 phases the, uh, on, on the magnitude and phase images the, the, uh, and determine the region of interest. And I will show you some reproducibility data later. So first study we did uh, was a cross-sectional study, in, again in collaboration with Professor Zamboni. Uh, 16 consecutive patients. It's uh, the same study I presented before. Eight patients uh, from, uh, uh, and four controls from Italy, eight patients and four controls from United States with mean age of 36 years and 7.5 of disease duration with mild disability. As I said, all of them had CCSVI and none of the healthy controls. So in this first study, we correlated the CCSVI uh, severity with uh, 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 net CSF flow and found uh, extremely good uh, correlation. So lower net CSF flow in MS patients was related to CCSVI. Uh, clearly the hemodynamic alteration in CCSVI that we observed in this study consisted of high frequency of venous segments, uh, segments exhibiting reflux, flow block, B-mode imaging uh, abnormalities, uh, all that lead to the increased severity of CCSVI. Uh, also in this study, beyond just finding a correlation between severity of CCSVI and decreased CSF flow, we found uh, a small difference between the net CSF flow in MS patients compared to controls. However, another study that was published in Annals of Neurology did not find the differences on 20, in 21 relapsing remitting patients and 20 healthy controls. Uh, so given together that in these two studies, our pilot study, we found the differences, and then in the other studies uh, were not found the differences, although we have a major criticism to how the Sandstrom study has been done for technical reason, just based on a number of slice thickness that used and, and other parameters, we felt it would be important to embark on a much bigger study to evaluate uh, how the CSF flow relates principally to MS and clinical out disease and uh, uh, MRI outcomes out of CCSVI. So clearly, Nobody until now evaluated the role of CSF hemodynamics in relation to MS lesions and atrophy. And uh, we hypothesized that uh, impaired CSF flow dynamics may interplay also with enlargement of the third, fourth, and lateral ventricles, which are signatures of uh, MS disease porosis from the first clinical attack. This is just to give you an idea. This is a patient with 10 years, 15 and 20, and you can see how these ventricles are enlarging. And if I would show you from the first clinical attack, patients in first five years are enlarging about 60% in their ventricles. So we have kind of normotensive hydrocephalus situation in MS that it's attributed to the lesions. Um, and sometimes it's very difficult to explain enlargement of the ventricles when you have a cerebellar or a spinal cord lesion. So in these cases, nobody speaks why there is this kind of a huge uh, enlargement of the ventricles. Now, the data that I'm going to show you now are not yet published. They have been presented at American Academy last year. Uh, uh, they are hopefully extremely soon going to enter in a press 
in major uh, MRI journal. So we uh, evaluated 35 healthy controls and 67 MS patients, of which nine have been CIS, 48 have been relapsing remitting, and 19 have been secondary progressive. Uh, no difference in age and sex, and obviously, as expected, MS patients have lower brain volumes, gray matter volumes, uh, 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 larger lateral ventricle, third ventricle, and four ventricle uh, 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 volumes. And obviously, there were uh, clearly differences between CIS, RR, and SP as expected. This is the scan rescan reproducibility done in two MS patients and two healthy controls between the MAC and what General Electric Scanner is uh, uh, providing, which is a report card. Uh, now, because the GE does not use as neither one uh, available tool, as I told you, uh, there is a great difference when you do the scan rescan reproducibility uh, looking on a dynamic change of the ROIs through the cardiac cycle respect to the static one. And that's true also for the net negative and net positive flow. Clearly, we didn't uh, uh, have tools that would influence the velocity, and that's why this was done with the GE report card, which had uh, very good uh, 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 reproducibility values. So the major finding is that the, in microliters per bit, the net flow was 7.1. Uh, in healthy controls versus minus 3.7, it's always minus sign, in MS patients, which gives a p-value of 005. Now, uh, if you look the CIS, RR, and SP, uh, although having a trend, there was no uh, a significant difference. Uh, what we found majorly to be altered are these net negatives and positive flows which always got in a, in a uh, uh, you know, wrong direction in MS patients from what you would expect, and I will show you that in a second. The positive flow was significantly different for uh, uh, being higher for MS patients. Uh, there was also, uh, to some extent, a uh, trend for uh, uh, change in the average short axis. There was also a trend for peak positive velocity. Now, what this number tell us? So these are in blue health controls, and these are in red MS patients per every phase of the cardiac cycle. And what you can see is that MS patients need to push more on a negative side and more on a positive side to expel CSF from the Silvius of Aqueduct. And if you look CIS, RR, and SP patients, they need to push the, uh, uh, less the CIS, more RR, and the most SP on a negative side and on the positive side. That means that in some way there is some obstruction for which MS patients need to use more energy, more to, in order to expel that CSF volume uh, 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 through the Silvius of Aqueduct. Uh, we, do the, we did the same for the velocities, and you can kind of appreciate that it was a very similar situation, but not as pronounced uh, for, as for the uh, uh, flow values. Um, then we looked uh, the correlation between CSF flow and uh, most important MRI parameters in MS. So net negative and net positive flow correlated in the right direction with T2 lesion volume extremely, as you can see here, with the T1 lesion volume and uh, also number of T1 lesions. Also, there was very strong correlation between CSF flow and enlargement of the ventricles third ventricle and fourth ventricle. And also, there was a correlation with white matter atrophy, but not with gray matter atrophy. So the, the results were mostly driven by the relapsing remitting patients. We didn't so much impact in secondary progressive disease. Now, 
the, I will tell you a little bit more what we found. The MS disease process is clearly characterized by the accumulation of lesions and development of brain atrophy. And it's, this study we showed for the first time that altered CSF low dynamics and velocities in the aqueduct of Cilius are related to increased T1 and T2 lesion volumes and lesion number, as well to more advanced central and white matter atrophy, but not gray matter. Decreased CSF net flow was related to conversion of clinically definite MS in five of the nine CIS patients who relapsed in the following year. And there was a trend from all CSF flow values that we looked net, positive, negative, and velocities with the number of relapses in the previous year. So let me repeat that. Those who have lower CSF flow developed more, uh, significantly more at all seven level, uh, clinically definite MS, which means second clinical attack, and those who had lower CSF flow had more relapses over the last year. This finding suggests that CSF flow dynamics and velocities may be profoundly associated with MS disease process. Clearly, larger cross-sectional CSF flow and venous flow studies are needed to investigate the relationship between the hemodynamics of venous and CSF flow in MS patients and patients with other neurologic diseases. I think that longitudinal CSF flow studies from first clinical onset in these patients, in patients with first clinical attack, are needed to demonstrate that their altered CSF flow can predict conversion to clinically definite MS. Accumulation of lesions, central atrophy, on, and occurrence of relapses has to be investigated in relation to CSF and venous flow hemodynamics, uh, not only in CS patients, but in early RR. So uh, I'm judging this as one of the major studies we did in the last uh, two years, uh, and very much uh, 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 giving a new insight about uh, uh, how the CSF flow may be impacted in multiple sclerosis. I saved five, more than five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. I also would like to ask the first question. Do you think the CSF abnormality is similar to that in, the, in case of the normal pressure hydrocephalus? Or totally uh, different? I think uh, not to that extent, and as a matter of fact, to answer your question, we are embarking on a study that's going to compare MS patients with hydrocephalus patients in uh, uh, a collaboration with the Department of Neurosurgery. In that study, we are going to not just measure uh, the CSF flow of aqueduct Silvius, but we are measuring the CSF flow arterial and venous flow at the level of foramen minimum. As well, we are measuring arterial and venous flow uh, on the level of the jugular veins. Uh, we are also in, in all these groups, healthy controls, MS and hydrocephalus, and we are working, although that's probably three to five year development, on measures of volume of the brain, as we are good in measuring brain atrophy, how these changes, which we will know definitely based on all these measures, how much is getting in and how much is getting out. And so the question is, uh, if you look the Alperin work, uh, 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 according to the Moro Kelly hypothesis, that has to be zero. As much should go in and as much should go out. But we believe this is not the case, and uh, because there are subtle differences, and I think that these subtle differences, if we can measure them accurately, can be associated with uh, uh, MS and hydrocephalus and other diseases. Hmm, interesting. We are waiting for your result. Robert, Any question from the audience? Um, yeah. mm -hmm, Do you have data of CSF flow during relapses? No, that was our exclusion criteria. I don't have, but great point. Thank you, a really exciting study because CSF is really important. And I wondered if in this long-term, or in this 
pre and post angioplasty study that you're already embarking on? Are no, you, it's, it's not. Ah, you mean the premise. With Dr. Yeah. Sadaki. Yeah. yeah. So are you happening to do any studies on CSF? We anything? do. We Fantastic. Do. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Professor. Now we move on to the next follow topic. Follow up to that, please. Ah, yeah. Dr. Sadaki. Yeah. Just a follow-up question to Dr. Coates along the lines of post-treatment. One of the things we see with the procedure on patients who have sequential procedures is a diminishing return on the symptom relief on sequential procedures. If you're looking at CSF flow on patients who have undergone the procedure more than once, are you seeing any trends or changes in the CSF uh, dynamics? I can't answer you this question. I don't know. I mean, we... Uh, first, uh, uh, we did some work uh, uh, with Professor Zamboni, but we didn't have this uh, in, a, in a study. Uh, now in this study we are doing it, but we are completely blinded, so we don't know who is treated and who is not treated. So I, I, I can't answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will move on to the next topic. No no more pressure has a service in the CCSVI that will be presented by my co-chair, Dr. Sovi, please. Okay, thank you. From Ethan. So now, today we talk about uh, idiopathic normal pressure radiocephalus. This is the first review in uh, 2001 by Ebb in neurosurgery. Uh, MPH can be divided in, in two main categories, idiopathic and secondary. The, the cause of this uh, secondary form usually is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, intraventricular parenchymal hemorrhage induced by trauma and aneurysm. Infection may be a, another cause. Inflammation condition and uh, rare disease such as Paget disease or the school. No racial predilection has been described and uh, no gender predilection. Usually, idiopathic uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus can occur commonly in the sixth, seventh decade of life. This is the first description in 1965. It's a really young disease. And uh, what uh, Adams brought is uh, the, the association of a progressive mental deterioration and neurological disturbances associated with the hydrocephalus, but with normal pressure on a lumbar puncture and the absence of a papilledema, papilledema. And these are the three major characteristics of uh, this disease. Gait abnormality, urinary incontinence, cognitive impairment. This is a triad, very important for diagnosis. Gait abnormality is the most prominent clinical feature in every stage and the, the more common. It is described as a magnetic gait. Uh, the steps are, are short and the, the feet are outwardly rotated. I show you now. It's really magnetic and small step. Okay, this is very important to 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 know because this is very different from uh, other gate, such as a uh, pyramidal gate or a uh, Parkinsonian gate. And this is not unusual in a MS population. The second point, cognitive impairment. It is uh, characterized by prominent loss of subcortical and frontal features. Executive functioning is impaired early in the course. And we, we saw a sort of a psychomotor slowing, apathy, and decreased attention and concentration. The patient looks like depressed, but is not. Is only mild. Is only cognitively impaired. The third, urinary incontinence, is usually seen in advanced stage, 
And uh, this is very important to know that not always, not always, the, three, the triad is present. So sometimes maybe the gate, sometimes maybe gait and uh, cognitive impairment, but this is very important. The triad is not always present. MRI show ventricular enlargement that is uh, symmetric, usually symmetric. And uh, you can found uh, in, uh, in uh, traditional and conventional uh, MRI any cause of uh, obstruction to CSF flow. What everyone say is uh, this is due to dysfunction of uh, CSF dynamics with uh, low absorption through Pachyonian granulation and uh, not due to an increased of uh, production. After 10 years, we have the same problem. We, we have no major data regarding uh, etiology, classification, and treatment. We are in uh, 2011. But we, we, I want to do some observation and comment. Five. Number one, to date, no clinical picture or diagnostic test has definitely teased out in uh, idiopathic normal pressure endocephalo. Teased out from other dementia present in the early. And uh, up to now, the gold standard for diagnosis and remain the clinical improvement after CSF shunting. I saw a lot of uh, patient with MS with this, with this uh, child. Cognitive impairment, magnetic gait, and urinary incontinence. And uh, I think that this is a, a, a different entity out of uh, the classical MS symptoms. Maybe that normal pressure hydrocephalus is a part uh, is independent syndrome from uh, MS, the second. Having a patient with hydrocephalus and clinical uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus, shunting may normalize the ventricular dilatation but not relieve symptoms. So my comment is, uh, are we sure that the major problem in uh, PNH is the CSF drainage? Or is there is something else? This is the events index uh, that is uh, an index uh, that is very useful for uh, thinking diagnosis. But not always it, it is very easy to, to, to measure. And it can make very, very significant things. So we need a more robust marker for uh, NPH force. Up to now, the pathophysiology of uh, NPH has not been fully understand, understood, but impairment in absorption and drainage of CSF leading to the gradual accumulation rather than production in the suspected mechanism. But this is a very important. The exact mechanism of how NPH develops is yet to be determined. The last one. NPH is one of the few causes of dementia that is potentially reversible. There is no effective medical treatment for NPH and drugs such as acetazolamide or osmotic diuretics do not work. This is the same what we saw in, in other diseases such as MS, that we have many drugs but none can induce a major modification of the disease. There is something else. Ventricular shunt is the only treatment that has been found to provide benefit. The efficacy of the treatment range from 33% to 90%. The Cochrane review stated that there was no evidence to indicate whether placement of a shunt is effective in treatment of NPH. We are in 2011, the same story. The conclusion was mainly based on lack of randomized controlled style. 
is the problem outside the brain? So, I, I saw 11 patients with uh, affected by MS presenting the typical MPH clinical trial. This was my, my data. Mean age, 50. Age of onset, 30, of MS, 34. MPH, MPH after the onset of MS, about 10 years with a range, standard deviation. Gender is a pretty similar, but when you look for the form of MS, you see that no RR, no relapsing remitting form is present, are only progressive. All these 19 patients had the McDonald criteria for MS diagnosis and equal color Doppler positive for CCSY. MRI in all patients showed the classical MPH findings in addition to the MS lesion. This is one of my patients. You see the... Yeah. Yeah. You see the classical lesion and you see also the increased over the time size of the ventricle in axial. So, I'm glad to have a medical hypothesis. Idiopathic normal pressure radiosaphorus is associated with the CCSY. A way to add CCSY to the list of secondary normal pressure hydrocephalus like hemorrhage and uh, trauma and, and other, is the CCSY a cause of uh, idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus or both the condition? There are two in very interesting papers. Uh, this is one, the first one. Well, this, this uh, Japanese group said the idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephal group had a significantly greater frequency of uh, retrograde jugular venous flow, 95%, than the control group, 23%. This is very important. And the second paper, is this uh, ischemia in deep venous territory is not a prerequisite for uh, MPH. Patients with uh, high inflow MPH show alteration in superficial venous compliance and uh, a reduction in the blood flow returning via the sagittal sinus. This change together suggests that an, an uh, elevation in superficial venous pressure may occur in uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. This is uh, another important thing. This is the territory of uh, the deep cerebral rain outflow. And you see how the, this image resembles uh, this territory. This was a, this is one, one patient treated with uh, with uh, MPH and MS uh, treated with a uh, uh, balloon. And you see how is it thin, uh, the, the jugular vein on both sides, and uh, how is it uh, full of uh, engorgement, the intracranial portion of the collateral vein in the same patient. I don't lose time uh, with uh, showing what uh, Robert uh, did about the relationship with uh, CCSY and, uh, and um, the CSF uh, flow. And this is what uh, I think. Venous malformation in the neck and, and chest, CCSY, chronic CSF drainage insufficiency, normal pressure hydrocephalus. This is a fantastic cartoon uh, made by Matitaccia 
He's uh, an Italian writer. And uh, ventricular enlargement, CSF, and the superior sagittal sinus. Okay, in conclusion, the association between MPH, CCSY, and MS are probably more common than expected. The so-called subcortical atrophy in MS should be checked for MPH and may be a sign of altered venous outflow from the brain. Ventricular enlargement is the consequence of a difficult drainage of CSF into the superior sagittal sinus, but this is CSY related. The frequent and successful treatment of MPH with a intraventricular drainage may be related to the persistence of altered venous outflow from the brain. That means CSF remain stable. The main goal of MPH treatment may be to treat CCSY. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Guy, please. Thank you, Dr. Salve. A very interesting time that we're talking so much about CSF. I'm sorry, Bill Code from University of British Columbia. I have a patient with Luca areosis. I don't hope I'm saying that right. Yeah. And I'm not sure what the differences are. This patient, of course, was drained with the regular shunt, no improvement. And it sounds like even if you shunt these, you can't guarantee an improvement if you're using the typical ventricular peritoneal shunt. So we never ever did get the patient to have you know, their veins looked at. Could you comment a little bit maybe on leukoareosis versus NPH, normal pressure hydrocephalus? Is there, are they the similar scenario or are they different? It's a really different scenario, yeah. This is the, the, a more easy to, to, to compare each one, uh, CSSY and uh, NPH instead of a leukoreosis. I know that there are, in the, the next year, some publication regarding uh, leukoreosis and uh, alternate flow, venous flow. But uh, I think that is very difficult. And I, I don't know why they did the, the derivation, the ventricular derivation. Okay. It, it doesn't improve nothing. I, I asked you. No, it, it did not in this case. Yeah. They did the shunting, but yeah. no value. Another question? I have a question for you. How do you diagnose this MS associated with MPH? Do you do research test or any other CSF study to confirm that patient is MPH? You just, or you just diagnose it by clinical Features. Yeah, we have a huge population of MS. I have a, about 1,000 patients. In this population, I, I looked for a patient with a possible NPH. So yeah. Because then they did uh, all the stuff of uh, clinical, clinical features. Yeah. It was uh, test and uh, Someone, some of, it, of our patients have also subtraction of a CSF in order to, to see if uh, the improvement was real or not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. The, the last three topics will be chaired by Professor Sobi, please. Let me introduce the next speaker, is uh, Marcella Lagana. She came from Milan. Evaluation of a CSF flow in multiple sclerosis patient using phase contrast MRI. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, let me begin my presentation uh, saying that uh, it was a pleasure for me uh, collaborating with Dr. Eki and his group uh, for this project, that is the evaluation of the CSF read flow, CSF um, with phase contrast MRI in MS. We uh, analyzed 92 MS patients that have been acquired at um, the Applied FMRI uh, Institute and uh, we compare them with the 28 healthy controls acquired at Wayne State University and at my institute, uh, Don Gnocchi Foundation. The main uh, sequences we've uh, worked with are the 2D time of fly MR venography, and uh, we use it because it has a high axial resolution, so we um, evaluated the cross-sectional area of the internal jugular vein in order to subdivide the uh, subjects into stenotic and non-stenotic. Then we've analyzed two different phase contrast sequences with, that have been acquired with two different velocity encodings. One for the investigation of the uh, flow of the main arteries and vein of the neck and the other one uh, with the lower velocity encoding for the flow quantification of the CSF. And here is an example of um, uh, one of the cases we analyzed. It is uh, um, the plot of the arterial venous and CSF flows uh, normalized by the uh, cardiac cycle. And I pointed out uh, with the arrows the main points uh, that uh, we've analyzed as amplitude and timing. Uh, and they are mainly for the CSF, uh, its um, peaks, so the inflow and the outflow in and from the brain, and the outflow onset. And for the um, arterial uh, side, we analyze the systolic peak and the beginning of systole. One of the results is, uh, um, you see here, the correlation of the uh, CSF peaks. And you can see that uh, the, R the relapsing remitting patients um, have uh, a lower dispersion of the values, so of the um, two peaks. Um, and. Uh, um, um, and uh, that the uh, mean value of uh, the two peaks is lower for the uh, healthy controls uh, compared with the DMS patients, and in particular uh, compared to the relapsing remitting. Another result regards uh, the timing. So the delay between the CSF outflow uh, compared with the beginning of the, the systole um, this delay is lower for the MS population and the um, CSF outflow, outflow duration is reduced also in MS population. So concluding, we, we found um, differences uh, for the mean values of the CSF peaks, uh, in particular it's higher in, in, in the MS and uh, it's uh, uh, higher in the stenotic MS. Um, the CSF outflow duration is lower in MS and the CSF outflow onset uh, from the beginning of the input, that is the arterial input, is lower for the MS. And these findings uh, suggest these two main things, that is um, we have a reduced uh, brain compliance in MS patients uh, and this uh, um, decrease of compliance uh, affects the CSF dynamics. And also that an alteration of venous outflow, that is uh, the, steno the stenosis of the IGV, uh, can influence the CSF outflow. Thank you. Robert. So I, uh, congratulations for the nice presentation. I quite didn't understand where you measure the CSF flow. At, at which level? We measure at C2 level. I mean, if you look the literature, there are two main places where the CSF is measured. It's measured at the level of the aqueduct of Silvius or for Amen Manium. There is very little literature about the measurement at below levels of for Amen Manium. Can you comment on that? We've and how would that influence your data? We found literature about uh, Balident uh, uh, 2001 and uh, other studies of Stokart 
uh, investigating the C2 uh, level, so the CSF uh, at the C2 level, and comparing uh, um, these dynamics also with the... Because, sorry, but I have to insist on this, because at C2 level, you would already expect that majority of the CSF would have been taken by the arachnoidae villi and went to the superior sagittal sinus. So you would just take the smaller portion of the CSF that's going to be drained mm -hmm. versus the spinal cord. So I'm saying uh, that y yes, it can be done, but you are not going to see 85% of the main CSF that's going toward the, the, the superior sagittal sinus? Yes, you can, you can have um, some portion of the CSF that has been drained yet. You are saying that? Yes, but you can compare with other uh, literature and uh, I think that however further study uh, has to be done uh, with, uh, as you suggested before, uh, comparing both the, um, the CSF evaluation at the aqueduct of Silvius and at the foranian manium, and we can compare. Given that uh, you did it on a spinal level, it would be very interesting to look whether the primary progressive patients in your study have uh, 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 alt more alterations respect to the secondary progressive and the relapsing very meeting ones because you would expect in those patients really at that level uh, that's why we did it at such a high level of Silvius of Aqueduct maybe at Foramen Manium most of the people in the literature think that maybe the Foramen Manium is the best uh, uh, however uh, uh, you know at that low level probably primary progressive patients should have most of the change Actually, we didn't found that, so that primary progressive MS patients had uh, um, higher uh, changes. I don't know if it is because the primary progressive group is the, oh, I was seeing in my computer, that the primary progressive group is the, the lower, um, no, we have the lower number, so uh, 17 compared to the other groups. So we haven't found statistically significant differences in the PP group. Okay, we can move to the next presentation. A lamped parameter model for the study of a cerebrospinal venous flow. Stefani Marcotti, Italy. And I'm waiting for the presentation. Good morning, everybody. I'm Stefania Marcotti from Politecnico di Milano. I'm going to present this project that is a lamped parameter model for the study of cerebrospinal venous flow. It was carried on with my colleague Lara Marchetti at Politecnico di Milano, with the professors Botta, Redaelli, and Fiore, and with the collaboration of Fondazione Don Carlo Gnocchi in the persons of Marcella Laganà and Professor Cecconi, and uh, Isauta Italia. What we did at the beginning of our project was the study of venous vessel anatomical disposition in cerebrospinal area. And what we did was the definition of diameters and length through the literature data of the interest of the vessels of our interest. What we did later was the modeling of each venous vessel as an hydraulic resistance by calculating the value with Poisson law. And we wrote a model uh, with nodal equation and ohm law for each vessel. This is the model we get, and as, a, as input we have inlet arterial flow rates of the intracranial, vertebral, and lumbar district, and as output we have pressures and flows of each venous vessel that we decided to insert in the model. Uh, what we did after a physiological simulation was the, the simulation of four pathological patterns that um, are proposed by Zamboni. And this is an example we reduce the diameters of internal jugular veins, both, and the first stretches of adzigas, as one of the patterns is suggested to do. And we reduce, uh, so, the diameters of those vessels that are supposed to be impaired by CCSVI. And what we obtained was modifications in 
pressures both level intracranial and extracranial, and, and inverted flows in um, are, um, superior pretrosal sinus and thoracic plexus. What we did at the end was a comparison between our outputs from the model and the clinical ACD data that we have from CCSVI patients. And what we obtained was a qualitative um, overlapping of information. In fact, by reducing internal jugular veins diameters and adzigos diameters in our model, we obtained uh, inversion of flow in thoracic plexus and superior petrosal sinus as observed in clinical situation. What we are doing now is to insert in the model the dependence of resistances on pressure gradient and the model in standing position. In, in, or, in order to do that, we have to add the con convested compliance, and we have to add the linkage to capillary bed and arterial circulation. In addition, we have to add the regulation of the liquor and the thoracic band. Thank you for your attention. In your model, mm -hmm. I did not see the possibility to have intraestracranial venous anastomosis that may, be play, may play a role also in what you observed with uh, QDP at the level of, uh, of the Petrosus science. Mm -hmm. Do you think to improve uh, your model by adding this possibility, this escape flow, or yes, it this is, is so rigid through the internal vagus vein? No, it is possible. Anyway, we had the collateral uh, circulations when we decided to um, simulate the four pathological patterns. So we can add vessels, and in, a, in that case, we can add also um, the linkage between intracranial and extracranial vessels. Anyway, at the moment, we have uh, the intracranial that exit in both jugular veins, vertebral veins, and vertebral plexus. But anyway, we can add based on vessels if we wish because it's just uh, hydraulic resistance so we just need the diameters and length of the vessel of our interest and we can add it to the model. Okay, thank you. The last presentation is uh, Cranial Instability and CCSY, David Williams, Canada. So, am I working? There we go. Um, I feel uh, really honored and humbled to be able to talk to you today. Uh, the presentations have been very exciting to me and I have so many new questions uh, relative to my topic and I, I hope that uh, those of you who have presented um, will take the time to speak to me afterwards because um, what I'm presenting is something uh, that is way outside of the normal conversations that we've had to date and uh, being the only dentist um, in the room I'm assuming um, I think this is a, a great opportunity for all of us to kind of step back and see what um, might be involved outside of what we've seen. There have been many many questions that brought up today that I would like to address individually that I do not have time uh, so if Mark is still in the back there he's given me exactly ten minutes uh, to present something that I need two hours to do justice to, but um, I will try to stay within the time limit. So, um, with the uh, next, start with you. Oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, again, I started this slide in the patient uh, presentations, the patient day. Uh, this is a, a iPhone picture of a slide that was taken from a presentation in uh, in Scotland. I apologize to whoever slide this was um, for the bad quality, but um, it really has stuck with me and um, the sort of the launching point for my conversation with you. Um, we have uh, some conclusions that um, leave a lot of room for for looking elsewhere. Uh, the other factors uh, that are mentioned here and the uh, other things that have not yet been recognized that need to be looked at in conjunction with CCSVI. 
Um, as a dentist, um, I would like to bring up some elements of, of uh, cranial health that um, are very active. Um, it's a dynamic uh, animal we're dealing with here, the human, human species. We, we have um, a lot of things that animals don't suffer from, like emotional trauma and um, interesting diets that are, are uh, contributing to our problems. But from sleep disturbance, uh, the association of MS with trigeminal neuralgia, Incidence of headaches in MS is, is uh, double uh, the other population. Uh, dominance of, of jugular flow while, while sleeping. I'm not exactly sure all the details on that, but I do know that there is a difference between the flow in the jugular veins when, when we're standing up versus laying down. And the extreme forces that are involved in sleep clenching. Now when I say extreme forces, um, it's hard for me as a dentist because I see this all day long. I see what can happen to the teeth over time and um, to, to equate this, but um, when we look at the deterioration in the brain over time, especially um, you know, post-mortem with the, and so much has been said today about the size of the ventricles and the timing. Uh, to me, timing is everything in this conversation. Uh, going back in time, we're looking at the vitamin D and um, the, the, the story about vitamin D involves a lot more than just uh, how much you're getting. Um, if you're familiar with the, the, the amount of vitamin D that a patient has up to the age of 15, and this was in the literature that I first, st first studied early on, um, relative to climate and where the, where the person grew up, and if they move, immigration studies after the age of 15, their susceptibility to MS, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with these, I'm just bringing it up, because I think it's relevant to what I'm going to show you. Um, uh, the role of dental pathogens in venous inflammation and collagen deterioration in, in several different anatomical areas, these all tie in. Um, the discovery, this is more recently, uh, of oral spirochetes in the brain and the trigeminal nerve root. These haven't been evaluated, so far as I know, um, in, in MS, and uh, mostly in Alzheimer's cases, but we're talking 98%. And that could be argued that uh, dental home care goes down with loss of, loss of uh, ability to take care of yourself and uh, it may be a, a result of these other things but you'll see why I think it may be a part of it. Uh, the incidence of MS in, in women more than men would in, imply uh, in my uh, uh, thought process um, the differences between the hormones relaxin which um, makes the ligaments, all of them, uh, the, the in, impact of collagen on the impact of relaxin on collagen is very, very interesting. Um, and now the dominant role of trauma and stress in the progression of MS. I'm talking about um, lots of studies on people who have blunt trauma or a broken limb or any kind of trauma, emotional trauma, and the connections with the ad advancement of their disease. Um, and um, I'm going to introduce to you now a, a system of physical trauma that's connected to the emotional trauma through the dental system. Um, I'm talking about a, a, if you try to, to just think about all the questions and problems, including neuro, the um, discussion of normal pressure hydrocephalus, there's a big gap there because these are patients who have the appearance of neurologic loss that looks like hydrocephalus, but their, blood, their, their um, CSF pressure is normal. And there's just this big gap. What is doing this? So it looks like there's high pressure damage, but when we're examining them, the pressure is normal. And so um, what I'm suggesting to you is something that happens when no one's looking. This happens when we're not examining with any of our amazing tools and, and techniques that we've talked about through this weekend. Um, what I'm presenting is based in anatomy. My approach to this was um, extensive anatomy studies at the University of Calgary looking at uh, cad cadavers of MS. I have started with three that were preserved and then the rest were all uh, relatively um, fresh, I hate to say that word, but um, we were, I was able to look at them within 24 hours of their decease, and so the fluids were all dynamic and visible. Um, and of course this is dealing with the dental cranial dysfunction. Now what I found may answer some of the questions that have brought, been brought up today as far as timing. So uh, I really believe that timing is everything. If we have microbleeds, if we have accumulations of amyloid, if we have um, like Adams uh, was the first book that I studied when I first got into this and he was saying that the very first events that we know of with MS 
is the um, disruption of the small blood vessels that line the walls of the ventricles, and they're always, you know, uh, perivenous. Um, those parameters and the accumulation of iron, et cetera, I've talked with Dr. Zvadnov about that as well, you know, they don't seem to match, to, in my mind, if, if the blood vessels down low, extracranially, are backing up, like uh, plumbing backing up, and, and the problem is coming from there, it's been stated that that is a late problem. The CCSVI is a late problem. So with this timing and perspective, I'm going to suggest, uh, I, I published this study um, this past August, and um, so I'll present that study to you now. So my, my study is titled Bruxism and Top Temporal Bone Hypermobility in Patients with Multiple Sclerosis. I'll go really fast to this study because it, it, you can read it um, in uh, the Journal of Cranial Mandibular Practice. Uh, it's a dental journal. We measured the, the distance between the um, temporal bones. Uh, we used a system that was accurate as a pulsed phase lock loop ultrasound that, that uh, sent a beam of sound across and picked up echoes on each side. And it's accurate to, uh, in, 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 uh, extreme, in the extreme, they can actually measure the cardiac pulse and see the entire cardiac wave just looking at the distance between the temporal bones. And they use that to look at and they extrapolate the height of the peaks to find out intracranial pressure in the astronauts. This was done in San Diego with Dr. Alan Hargens. And the results of the study, uh, we did 10 patients, uh, 11 controls. Um, they only had to have a definite uh, diagnosis of MS from a neurologist. And we had them clenched to 100 pounds. This is very important. We could only calibrate up to 100 pounds, so we, that's why we picked that number. Um, right now in the audience, you should be able to clench. Uh, if, I, if I say clench as hard as you can, you can clench uh, into you know, three, probably more than 300 pounds. What's interesting is if I leave the meter in and have you go to sleep, uh, particularly if you're stressed or fatigued, and you can at least double that in your sleep. Okay, so we're at 100 pounds force. And what we found was that the uh, MS patients, I'll show the graph, um, there was a very, very large difference between the MS patients and the normal patients. And so um, the P factor in here was 0 .0008. Um, it wasn't a large uh, patient population, but um, if you notice in this graph, uh, one of the patients uh, clenched their teeth at 100 pounds, and the distance between the temporal bones shifted by 3.6 millimeters. Now, uh, just thinking about the volume of CSF, the, the amount of CSF that's around the brain, the volume that's inside the ventricles, and that kind of a change, uh, when you think about the compartmentalization of the brain by the, by the meninges and by the Falx cerebri and tentorium, um, this is going to have an effect on the fluids. Um, I want to quickly refer to a study by um, Dr. Bungie. It was, it's very old, it's about 50 years old now, but he looked at uh, cerebral spinal fluid in cats and he was injecting into the fourth ventricle with bacteria. He found that they developed lesions around the fourth ventricle in the site of injection. Um, he took the bacteria out and he, he, he called it CSF barbitage. And so he did these experiments and found that at certain rates of inflow and removal of the CSF, these cats all developed at very similar to MS lesions around the area of injection of the fluids. This was a big flag to me because what I'm suggesting is that um, demyelination can happen uh, just from abnormal flows in the vicinity. Um, and this is uh, what I'm in introducing here is a global phenomenon. You can imagine when this kind of pressure is being exerted on the system, it's going to, ha it's going to cause, at least I can see it in my mind, the uh, microbleeds, the, the disruption of those small blood vessels. And the key thing to me was that, um, of course, the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, the pattern of lesions is completely different from MS, as we always know, and that's been the big problem with it. And um, what I'm explaining here is that a, the pressure wave, like a tsunami, if you will, through the system caused by this dental clenching would, uh, in my mind, it would cause a, 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 a da the damage would happen exactly as we are seeing it. And the, again, we look at the timing. So um, this is just a slide showing the, the pole, uh, the dental and, and the anatomy part of it. Um, I've worked, uh, Dr. Arata has been uh, very helpful with this. And, uh, 
he has helped me understand from the perspective of, of what, what you do when you're treating the CCSVI. And he has success with patients, and, he, and when, he, when he doesn't have success, he's, he's referred me patients because of an uh, obvious uh, constriction, he calls it, in this area that I'm showing you on this slide. And so if you look at the slide um, and consider the temporal bone, you're looking at it from underneath, but if that temporal bone is being tipped the way that I've described, um, the, the spinous process is going to be impinging on the jugular vein at the same time that this pressure wave is being forced out of the, of the uh, skull proper. And uh, what you can't see here is the C2, which has also been mentioned. Uh, the Nuka chiropractic comes into play here. Um, what also you can't see in this image is the um, exit of the um, facial vein. Now, this brings in a whole, whole other aspect of what I'm trying to say here, and that is that um, the toxins that are re relative to the oral cavity, uh, it's, the, it's the place of ingestion, it's where all the foreign microbes get put into our systems. It's, uh, it's, a, it's the dirtiest place on the planet. It's a pleasure to work there, I can tell you. And um, this is the result. Um, the parietal bone of the red arrows and the temporal bone is, is tilting out away from the, the image here. What I discovered consistently in the anatomy studies that I did is that the, the, um, the step that you see here, uh, when I pressed where the blue word is, pressed, blood would come out of those sutures on every single MS patient that I looked at. On the same patients looking at the sagittal sutures, any other sutures that I could expose in the studies that I was doing, the sutures followed the pattern of your, you know, the medical dogma. Sutures after age such and such, they're fused, they're not relevant, they don't have any relevance to anything clinical. And so this is what prompted me to try to find a way to measure this live real time on the patients in which what we did in San Diego. Uh, this is a bone spur that I found at the lower border of the parietal bone, which would suggest that where the two sutures overlap, that there's actually a movement here which may have led to a, a turning inward of the lower border of the parietal bone, which brings up another question, which is, as we see the volume of the vascular tissue inside the brain diminish, is this strictly because of pressure dynamics, or is the volume of the skull actually less? And if, if this is relative to the bone uh, changes re that in what I'm talking about here. So um, this is just a showing that where the Falx system is, uh, you know, all these things. I just wanted to show one couple of last slides here. This is uh, uh, some anatomy studies. This is a, a, a separated tempor temporoparietal suture. And you see, the, I call this a ridge, which is the terminus of um, where the two overlap is a physical stop, which would prevent any kind of movement this direction. And the rays that I say are, are preventing any movement in this direction. And uh, there's so much variety in this particular suture, more variety in this particular suture than any of the sutures of the skull put together. And as you see here, there are no ridges and no rays. And this is uh, what I would postulate would be a condition in a patient that was raised without, like in a colder climate with uh, not a lot of vitamin D. And uh, this is a, an MS patient who is clenched using the cone beam scanners now that are available for dentists. And you can see that step all the way along. Um, so cranial displacement under jaw clenching creates short bursts of pressure within the cranium, which is going to traumatize all the tissues. It could lead to microbleeds, amyloid expression, axonal death, demyelination, uh, the degradation of the blood-brain barrier, inflammation, um, similar to a blunt trauma. And one of the things that I've done throughout my studies is compared all these aspects to the events that happen after trauma, like uh, uh, head trauma. And uh, there's so much similarity. So I'm just saying this is a phenomenon that happens subclinically in the late, late uh, hours of the night when nobody's looking. Uh, the expression of the trauma factors downstream in the venous system may be contributing, but just the pressure wave itself could be contributing to CCSVI. And so um, this could be the missing factor that we've been, uh, we've been saying there's something missing. And so um, as we continue to look for the other factors in CCSVI, the role of dental pathogens and cranial physiology related to dental dysfunction should be carefully considered in conjunction with st um, venous stenosis. Thank you. Yikes. Hello, I'm 
Carol Schumacher. Hi, Carol. Um, I have a question um, with regards to clenching and periodontal disease, mm -hmm. uh, specifically if you have uh, periodontal disease, a periodontal pocket, perhaps in the area where you're really doing the clenching. Are you um, maybe getting that bacteria into the bloodstream this is, more quickly? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, this is, there's a lot of studies. Uh, specifically, the bacteria we're talking about are spirochetes. Uh, Treponema denticola is originating from the, the gum pockets. And uh, this is the bacteria that's been found in the Alzheimer's brains. Um, there's no question that this gets into the venous system. Um, the studies with atherosclerosis have now been confirmed. Lots of papers on that suggesting that dental pathology, like the infections in the gums, are directly linked. I have uh, internists that, that if they can't get a diabetic patient's sugar under control, they send them to the dentist to have their, their periodontal pockets checked and cleaned up, and then they have a, a better result. But that's all been looked at again on the arterial side. And what's interesting is you look at the proximity of the damage and the potential damage from dental pathogens, and that doesn't just mean bacteria, of course. It's, um, there's all kinds of things that you know, already know about, all the dental uh, controversy with mer mercury amalgam and metal toxicities. And uh, when this uh, is brought in as a factor, it dumps directly into the jugular vein at just at exactly the same point that I showed there. So, uh, yeah, periodontal disease is a, is a serious matter. Time's up. Okay. Thank you. So now yeah. we, we go to the, the section. Robert? Uh, we are terribly late. One o'clock sharply. We are continuing. Thank you.